In the first two lectures, I use OpenCV for computer vision. OpenCV was very popular until machine learning became the mainstream methods for computer vision. In this lecture, I will talk about machine learning. What is machine learning? How do we define machine learning? Tom Mitchell is a professor at Carnegie Mellon University. He defines machine learning in the following way. A computer program is said to learn from experience E with respect to some classes of task P and the performance measured by P. If the performance improves with experience E, this seems pretty abstract. That's break down this definition into the following components. First, we are talking about machines. There is a computer program. We are not talking about humans or animals. Second, experience E. This abstract definition does not describe what the experience may be. In most cases, the experience means learning examples. In other words, data. Usually, more data is better. Task T. What do we want the computers to do? Do we want the computers to classify images, distinguish humans from animals, from cars or houses? Do we want the, com the computers to determine whether a vehicle should accelerate or decelerate? Do we want computers to tell us whether a person's face is happy or sad? These are the tasks we want computers to do. Performance. How do we define success? For image classification, we can say whether the images are classified correctly. If we give an image of a human and the computer says it's a human, that is correct. If the computer says that is a house, it is incorrect. For autonomous vehicles, we can define how many miles the vehicle travels without any accident. When we start learning computer programming, the programs usually follow the, this pattern. The program takes some input data and produces the output. The programs do not get better even if we execute the programs again and again. This is a scenario when there is no learning. In the second case, the programs produce output, but also discover patterns in the input data. In this case, we can say that the programs are learning some things from the data. In many cases, the previous scenario is actually divided into two different steps. The first step is called a learning. The second step is called a inference. In the first step, the programs discover the patterns in the data. In the second step, the programs use the discovered patterns to process the data and produce output. It is possible that the third and the fourth steps use different programs for learning and the inference. They are different types of, of learning. A widely used type of learning is called supervised learning. This is the situation when there is a teacher telling the learner or the student what things are. In this example, suppose a teacher shows several images of a pandas and then tells students and then tells students these are images of a panda. The learner looks at these images and tries to find the commonalities among these images. The pandas seem to have a black eyes, black ears, black limbs, white face, and so on. The learner may also discover some additional information, such as the pandas seem to be associated with some types of plants. Four of the five examples show leaves. Next time, if a teacher shows a new photograph, 
the learner may say, this is a panda or this is not a panda. The teacher will respond by saying, yes, you are correct or no, you have made a mistake. This is called supervised learning. Another type of learning is called unsupervised learning. There is no teacher telling the learners what is correct and what is wrong. Suppose the learner is given these images. The learner somehow discovers that they seem to have a different characteristics. Five of the photographs have this black and white thing. They seem to be similar to each other. Three photographs have this yellow and orange color with stripes. Two images have this white thing with long beaks. Nobody tells the learner the names of these animals. They are called panda, tiger, and crane. Instead, the learner simply discovers that they are different and they can be grouped together into three different types of uh, things. This is unsupervised learning because there is no teacher telling the learner the name of the, the animals and the characteristics of the animal. Unsupervised learning is widely used for many applications, for example, clustering data. Imagine you are running a company and you want to give customers promotion, such as discounts. You want to classify the customers if into different groups. For example, a group of customers may have a purchase close from you. Another group of customers may have purchased furniture from you. Yet another group of customers may have purchased electronics from you. You want to classify these customers based on their preference and purchase history. For the customers that have purchased electronics from you, you may give these customers coupons for electronics. There is no teacher telling us which group a particular customer should be. You simply look at the data and decide how to cluster the data. In the previous two examples for supervised and unsupervised learning, the decisions are pretty much instant. For supervised learning, the teacher shows an image and the learner decides whether that image is a panda or not. For the unsupervised learning, the learner decides whether an image belongs to one of the three categories or not. If a new image shows up, the learner may put this image into one of the three categories. In many other situations, the correctness of the decisions cannot be determined immediately. Consider you are playing a chess game. Is a move a good move or a bad move? It is difficult to determine that right away. Instead, we have to wait for the game to reach a state where we can determine the winner. This is called reinforcement learning. This type of learning needs to wait and evaluate the effect of a sequences of decisions. Another type of learning is called transfer learning. This is a situation when the learner already has knowledge in one domain and wants to use the knowledge for another domain. The first is called the source domain. The second is called the target domain. Imagine that you already know English. This is your source domain. You want to learn Korean. This is your target domain. You can use the knowledge about English, such as sentence structures, the concepts of a subject, verb, and object. When you learn Korean, you can analyze a sentence using this concept. For many years, humans have wished to create something that can have intelligence. The first challenge is the definition of intelligence. Alan Turing created one definition of intelligence. Suppose a person C interacts with two entities A and B. The interactions are limited to questions and answers. In this example, A is a machine, B is a real person. If person C is unable to determine whether A or B is a machine or a human, 
then we will consider machine A as intelligent. This definition has some advantages. First, it gets out of the philosophical discussion about intelligence. Instead, it focuses on the interaction and operation. The definition is broad because it does not restrict the interactions. C may ask many different types of questions, including questions that may involve feelings and emotion. Also, the questions may occur in different formats, such as text or voice. If a question appears in voice, the machine needs the ability to understand spoken language. The intelligent machine needs the ability to understand a human natural language, such as English, or Korean, or Japanese, or French, or Chinese. This definition also has some disadvantages. When humans consider intelligence, we often associate the concept with some characteristics that are not easy to define, such as the ability to learn and the ability to generalize. Moreover, many people believe that intelligence must have the concept of intuition or consciousness is able to make decisions in complex environments. If a machine is able to memorize all the conversation that has happened in a world and randomly pick some of them in certain ways. When a person has a conversation with this machine and the machine seems to be able to respond in meaningful ways, does that mean the machine is intelligent? Or the machine simply picks some past conversations and replay those conversations? That is a question experts are still debating whether that is intelligence or not. One way to use the Turing test is to give tasks that are very difficult for machines. For many years, chess games were considered a good candidate for a Turing test. In 1989, IBM started a project building a computer system for playing chess. In 1996, IBM's Deep Blue played against the world champion Kess Parov and lost 2-4. In 1997, they played again. This time, Deep Blue won 3-2 with one draw. This was the first time a computer program beat a world champion in chess. After the event, there were many discussions about whether Deep Blue was intelligent. Deep Blue represented a major milestone in computer technologies. However, the general consensus is that Deep Blue was not intelligent. Deep Blue was extremely good at playing chess, but Deep Blue did not have the ability to learn. It was not easy for Deep Blue to play another type of games. It would be difficult for to generalize Deep Blue to play games such as Go. Deep Blue had a major advantage over humans. Deep Blue could generate many possible moves and evaluate which moves were more likely to win. After Deep Blue, researchers wanted to take on a bigger challenge. They considered a harder game. This time, they cho chose the Go game. This game is more difficult because there are many more options. Because of the huge numbers of options, Deep Blue's strength was not particularly useful for playing the Go game. Instead, the researchers needed to find some other ways for computers to play the Go game well. A company called DeepMind took the challenge by using reinforcement learning. The basic concept is that the machine played against itself and learned from itself. In 2016, DeepMind beat the world champion in a Go game, Lee Sedong. If you are interested in the story of DeepMind, please watch this YouTube video. In June 2022, there was a lot of discussion about a claim by a Google researcher that a chatbot had become sentient because the chatbot 
appear to say things that might reflect consciousness. At this moment, this is still a highly debatable topic. We will see how experts react to this claim.